for the reading of the word this morning. Chapter 26, verse 39, speaking about Jesus, and said he went a little further, fell on his face, and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Let's pray. Father, we ask for your direction and for your anointing this morning upon your word. I just pray, God, that you'd have your way in the remainder of the service. Be with me this morning, Lord, as I share the things uh, concerning the this time of year, the Easter season. And so I just ask for your blessings. I pray that everyone here will be blessed this morning and will be drawn close to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated if you wish. <clears throat> this is Easter service, and the, the, the next Sunday is Easter. <coughs> Uh, and when I was working on this, what I want to do today, I, I got to thinking I should have made this probably three or four messages, so I'm going to try to cover it all today, but what I want to talk about today, I want to lead up to the, the time of the resurrection, so I'm going to be talking about actually the crucifixion this morning and the events leading up to the, crucif the crucifixion. Uh, we find that uh, this is a uh, time of the year, uh, almost 2,000 years ago, when Jesus was crucified. He died for the sins of the world. As we look at the reason for his death, the reason Jesus died on the cross is for the sins of the world. Uh, and I think it's great uh, this is not a, was not a band-aid fix that Jesus did on the cross. Uh, he did not cover our sins with his blood on the cross, but the fact is he took our sins away. Uh, we had, we've had some discussions at uh, our ministers' meetings about uh, whether or not Christians are sinners, and I've heard a lot of Christians say, oh, I'm a sinner. Well. I got news for you this morning. If you're a Christian, you're not a sinner. Uh, that's the opposite. A sinner is the opposite of being a Christian. The Lord didn't, as I have already stated, He didn't just cover up our sins, but He took them completely away from us. And there isn't any place in the Bible where we are called sinners. Did you know that? You know what the Bible calls us? If you read in the Bible, you know what, the, what, what we're called? Every place we're mentioned in the Bible, we're called saints. That's what we are. Now, I know that that word has been used in a different way, uh, but that's the fact is when the Bible uses the word saints, it's talking about any and every Christian. That's who it's talking about. And so this morning as we look at that, I want to read the scripture here in the 26th chapter of Matthew, and I'm going to do quite a bit of reading and spend quite a bit of time this morning in Matthew 26. You know what would be interesting if each one of you would, would get your Bibles and read the complete story of the crucifixion and the resurrection and so forth and read it in all four Gospels. And uh, you'll, uh, it, it, it's very Interesting and all the different things that's happened around the crucifixion of Christ. A lot of things has happened. And so uh, let me just start reading here this morning. I want to start reading in verse 36. This is Matthew 26. So starting at verse 36 and going to 46. Now I didn't do that like that on purpose. It just was the setting that I wanted to use. Uh, then cometh Jesus... Uh, with them into a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here, while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. And I, I think about that, and I, you know, I think about what Jesus was going to go through. Uh, and you know, I believe that Jesus knew ahead of time what he was going to go through. I think he knew everything he was going to go through. 
And he did not want to go through with that. He really did not want to go through with that. But as our, as our uh, text verse, which I'm going to reread here in a little bit, uh, he, he prayed to God and he said, Oh, my father, he said, uh, uh, if, it, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. In other words, this event, when the word cup, it means this event. Let this event pass from me. Uh, he was saying, I don't want to do this. And if you can imagine, I'm going to go through some of the things that Jesus suffered here uh, and so forth. But uh, uh, here he began to pray, and, and he was very heavy and very sorrowful. Uh, the Bible says, Un as unto death, it was very difficult for him. And let's remember that when Jesus was going through this, he was not Superman. He was not a superhuman being. He was a person just like you and I. He had all the feelings that you and I have. He, uh, he had all the attributes that we have. Uh, in, did you know that Jesus, when he walked, he got tired and, and uh, he had to have rest when he, he needed food, so he got hungry. Uh, he needed water when he got thirsty. He did just everything. And as far as the emotional things in life, Jesus went through emotional things just like you and I do. He was a human being. And I want you to think of him this morning as he goes through these, this situation. Think of him as being a human just like you are. Uh, and so let's just, uh, let's just read on a little bit. Uh, verse 39, and he went a little further, fell on his face and prayed. This is our text, uh, saying, Oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. He was willing to do the will of the Father, the will of God. And he cometh unto his disciples, finding them asleep, and saith unto Peter, What, could you not watch with me one hour? And here his, his leading disciples, there's three of them there, that, uh, that was with them. And he took them away from the other nine and he was there by himself. And he said, you just watch here and pray. Uh, watch, watch while I go pray. And he came back and he found them sound asleep. Uh, so there are some times in life that we need the support of others. We need the encouragement. and. Uh, and the love and, and uh, uh, the friendship, the companionship, and so forth. And especially in our roughest times, we need those around us that love us and those that we love. And so here we are this morning, and these uh, fell asleep. I don't know if they didn't realize the importance and the severity of what was going on, but they allowed themselves to go to sleep. Verse 41, Jesus said, Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Uh, so many times I have found myself uh, thinking those words or similar words to that. There's uh, so many times I wanted to do things for God, and I was just so tired that uh, I just couldn't accomplish uh, some of the things that I wanted to do at times and just studying and and praying and other times and and uh, dealing with people that trying to help people that was hurting and people that needed a friend and uh, it, it just uh, uh, sometimes there's just not enough strength uh, I used to say there's not enough hours in the day but now there's plenty of hours I just don't have the strength to do the things that I need to do sometimes so verse 42 said, He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. Uh, and he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to his disciples and saith unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Arise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. So, there Jesus, even when he was going through 
this horrible time, he still understood the needs of his disciples and had compassion for them, uh, realizing that they was tired and needed sleep and, and also realizing what they were going to face because they were going to witness a lot of the abuse and the things that took place in the life of Christ. And so as we look at this, uh, we, I want to just kind of, uh, I'm going to have to go uh, kind of fast through some of this stuff for the sake of time, and I've got a lot of uh, uh, ground to cover here this morning. So uh, if we look in, in uh, uh, let me see, I've, I've got here verse 2, is that, let me look again here. What, what we're going to do, we're going to go back in time here uh, before he went to the garden to pray. So we're going to go back to that time, and in verse 2, we find that Jesus foretells his betrayal. He, he knows that he's going to be betrayed, and he's going to be betrayed by one of his closest followers, a man by the name of Judas Iscariot. Uh, he was one of the twelve that followed Jesus, and and uh, one of the twelve that, uh, uh, that shared in the ministry that the others all shared in. I believe that Judas uh, went out and, and with the other twelve, the other eleven, and he healed the sick and prayed for people and, and cast out devils. I think he did all the same things that the others did until he reached that place when for some reason he decided to go and betray uh, the Lord. So. Uh, in verse 3, we look at, this, at the Sanhedrin court, and the head priest was named Caiaphas. And so Caiaphas was there, and, and uh, uh, verse 3, and go on to verse 4, and, and they're trying to figure out, the, the, the ministers on the Sanhedrin court, they're trying to figure out how they can get Jesus and take him and put him to death. That's what they desired to do and they wanted to know how to do that and so uh, we find that uh, uh, as we look at this that we find that Judas came to the Sanhedrin court and he made a deal with them I guess we could call Judas the hitman uh, here in this situation and I think it's ironic that later when uh, when uh, Judas realized what he had done, he repented and he didn't want to have any part of this. And he had made a deal with the Sanhedrin court that he would betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And so what he did, when he realized uh, what he had done, he cried and was very bitter. And he went out and he committed suicide. And, but before he did, he brought those 30 pieces of silver back to the temple and he went to give them back and the, the, the priest in the, in the temple said, we can't receive those into the treasury because it's the price of blood. This was, this was uh, something that was paid to, to take a man's life. And don't you think it's kind of ironic that these was the men that actually paid this money and then turned around and said it was wrong for what Judas did uh, after they hired him to do it. Uh, what a terrible uh, uh, scenario here and this what I would call a double standard. Uh, and so uh, we find that uh, this was done. Now verses uh, 7 through 12 is an interesting, interested uh, uh, setting of scripture and I'd like to read this this morning for you what happened and this is something that's not uh, mentioned a lot of times uh, at Easter time but as we look at Matthew still in verse <coughs> chapter 26 verse 7 through 12 the Bible says there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box a very precious ointment and poured it on his head as he sat at meat and when the disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, To what purpose is this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. When Jesus understood it, he said unto them, Why trouble ye the woman? 
for she hath brought a good work upon me. For you have the poor always with you, but me ye have not always. For in that she hath poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. So she anointed the body of Jesus in preparation for his burial. I don't know just how much this woman understood about what she was doing, but I believe she was led of the Spirit. And uh, so Jesus' body was anointed before that he died. Uh, and so uh, we, we look at the situations that, uh, uh, that's going down. We see that uh, there's a lot of things that has happened uh, here in this whole situation. As we look a little further in Scripture, we look at the Passover meal. Now, the Passover was a, a, uh, a, an, an event that was ordained of God, and the Jewish people was commanded to eat the Passover once a year. And so they began to eat this Passover and, and, uh, and celebrate this, and, and Jesus was eating the Passover with his disciples. And in verse 26 and 27, it says, As they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and brake it, and gave to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink it, all of you. Now, we know that this is a scripture that's used in most Christian churches uh, in, in, uh, uh, whenever they have what is called today the communion service. Uh, I could spend a whole message on just that subject alone because that is a very important subject, uh, what, what happened here. But I want to just briefly cover that this morning because I think it's important. And the thing about this whole situation, this was a Passover meal, and the Bible teaches us, and I, I just don't have time to get into all the Scripture uh, on this, but the fact is that all the things of the Old Testament that the Jews did in Israel, that the nation Israel, which is called Jews at this time, uh, and uh, as we look at this whole situation, we find that all those things in the Old Testament was things that was literal, and after the cross they became spiritual. And uh, we can read in the book of Hebrews and in, uh, and in also Colossians, and we can read about these things. And the Passover is something that was done in the Old Testament, but the Bible says that Christ our Passover was crucified for us. So we don't observe Passover anymore. Uh, we're not supposed to do that. We're not supposed to observe those things that was practiced by the Jews in the Old Testament. And that includes Sabbath keeping, that includes many, many other things, dietary laws, we're not uh, uh, required to observe those, all those things back in the Old Testament. Now, when you look at this, what ha was happening here is Jesus was eating the Passover with the disciples. And we need to, to keep that in mind, and we are to, to realize that the things in the Passover, in fact, I wrote a, a, a little booklet on that, that explains all the things that took place in the, in the Passover a celebration and how that they all have a spiritual fulfillment uh, after the cross. So it's spiritual. Uh, let's turn to the book of John, chapter 6, and begin reading in verse 53. And I want to show you the real interpretation of the, of the wine and the bread that Jesus shared with the disciples. And here's what it says in the 6th chapter of John, verses 53 to 63. And then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Now it sounds like Jesus is embracing uh, cannibalism here. But that would be the literal... Uh, interpretation of what he actually said. But Jesus said a lot of things in his ministry, and it was this way in the Jewish nation in Israel. There was a lot of things that was said that was metaphoric, and of course this is too. 
Verse 54 says, Who so eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and out in my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him. Jesus is talking about the close relationship that we have with him. Uh, we have a very close relationship with Christ. He dwells within us and we partake of him every day of our life as Christians. He's there to guide us and be with us and, and to minister to all of our needs. Verse 58 says, This is the bread which came down from heaven. Let me read verse 57 again. As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead, but he that eateth this bread shall live forever. And he's talking about the, the, the wine and the bread here, his body and his blood. Okay, these things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this said, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? Now listen closely. And when Jesus knew himself, that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? And, and verse 62, What and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? That's a question. Let me read that again as a question. What and if you shall see the Son of Man set, ascend up where he was before? And verse 63 is the key to this whole situation. He said, It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So Jesus is explaining that when he said to eat his flesh and drink his blood, that it was to be fulfilled in a spiritual sense, not a literal sense. And so, uh, as we look at this, this was the, the fulfillment of that scripture when he shared the bread and the wine with the disciples and he was teaching them a spiritual lesson and telling them, uh, so what today is, the bo is, is his body? And in, 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 the, in the, uh, the book of Corinthians, the apostle Paul wrote, and he said, Know ye not that ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. We as individuals are the body of Christ, according to New Testament teaching. And as uh, uh, so the question is asked, and I heard this a story once. I'm not going to take the time to tell you the whole story, but uh, when it comes to the blood of Christ, where do we, when do we partake of the blood of Christ and how do we partake of it? How many here this morning knows that we're saved by the blood of Christ? Our, the, you know, the Bible says that in several places. We're saved by the blood of Christ. When somebody comes to the Lord for salvation, they want to be saved and become a part of God's body, God's kingdom, then they <coughs> themselves up to the Lord, and the Bible says we're saved by His blood. If the, if the blood of Christ is to, is to be taken literally or even symbolically, then I'll, I just have to ask you a question. Then why, when, when people come forward to get saved, why don't the churches today give them a little drink of wine? Because that represents the blood of Christ according to their teaching. But you know what? We, we, it is a spiritual application. It's a spiritual thing that takes place when we get saved. And so this morning I wanted to just share that with you and, and I just kind of hit the highlights on that. Uh, but it's a fact that we need to observe spiritual things and, uh, and so forth. And there's so much that could be said about this. But um, if I've already taken a lot of time, I don't want to spend any more time on that. Let's go to Matthew 26 again, and down to verse 31. Uh, it, it says, Then Jesus, then saith Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. 
For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men leave it up to Peter to speak out and be very bold and so forth. Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. How many has felt like that? You know, I'll never be offended with Christ, and, and I know you really mean that and so forth, but a lot of times people, although they say that, they face certain situation, and lo and behold, it's difficult as to, to hold, to, to be steadfast in the things that you've said. Uh, when, when persecution and so forth comes, especially if you're alone and, and uh, you don't have the body of Christ of uh, Christians around you, it's difficult to be firm and, and steadfast in your faith. And Peter, I believe he really meant this. Lord, I'll, I'll never uh, deny you. And Jesus told him, uh, and I'm just going to go on here without reading it, but he, he uh, Jesus told him, he said, Peter, before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, he said, you will deny me three different times. Well, when they came and arrested uh, Jesus, now Peter had, a, a, or uh, uh, Judas had agreed to, to betray Christ. And we know the story how that, uh, after they was praying in the garden, they, they just finished praying. And here comes Judas with a whole crowd of people that had swords and stabs and, and they come up there and, and Judas came up and, and kissed Jesus and he said, Hail Master. And uh, so we find that that was the signal that Judas was given to the Sanhedrin that when I say that, this is the man that you're looking for. And well, they took Jesus and they arrested him and I'm going to move along here. And they took him to the Sanhedrin court. And, uh, and so as they uh, went to the Sanhedrin court, they uh, began to put Jesus on trial there. And they brought false witnesses uh, uh, up there to testify against our Lord and all these things. And so we find that it was a horrible thing that took place, especially from this point forward, uh, because uh, uh, it, it, they, the things they did to Jesus, and they, they brought him before the Sanhedrin court, and, and they found him guilty, and, and, uh, but uh, they, they wanted him to be put to death, but they didn't have the authority to put him to death. They, they, the law of the land would not allow it. The Roman Empire would not allow it. It took the governor to do that. And so they took Jesus and they kept him overnight. And the next morning they brought him into Pilate, who was the governor. And they brought him before Pilate and they began to uh, bring these accusations and they wanted him crucified. And we find, uh, see if I can find, I have... Uh, the, uh, the things that they did, as we look at, uh, I'm in chapter 27, I'm going to skip on ahead. Uh, for the sake of time, I want to move ahead here. But we find that uh, what they did is they, they did the most horrible things that you can imagine to Jesus. They, they beat him with a whip until they, they just split his back wide open. And they, 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 uh, it's been said that you can see the bones in his back, his backbone, and several things that it was, it was so bad. And they took him and they mocked him. They said, oh, you're the king of the Jews. And so they took his robe off and they put a royal robe on him. And then they began to make fun of him and call him king and, and all sorts of things. They spit in his face. They slapped him with their open hand. They just slapped him around. and. And they did all these things, and Jesus just stood there, and he took all of these things that they did for him. And so they, they planted a crown of thorns, and they put that on his head, and I can just see them push that down, and the blood come out uh, as they did this. And, and uh, they, they hit him, and, and then they finally, they took him out, and, and uh, Pilate, kind of give way to the 
to the crowd, and so the they, uh, pilot gave him permission and said, well, we're just, well, go ahead and crucify him. That's what everybody wanted. You see, Pilate was in a particular uh, a political quandrum there because uh, he was the governor over the, the uh, Jewish people, and he wanted to be in good favor with them, and, and he let them go ahead or give the order for Jesus to be crucified, even though he knew that Jesus was not guilty of the things that they was accusing him of. And they accused him of, of uh, trying to be the king and, and overpower the, the uh, uh, Pilate's position and all this sort of thing. So they took Jesus and they crucified him. They nailed him to the cross and put him up there to die and he died between two thieves that was being crucified at the same time for the crimes that they had done. And so then we find that uh, as, as we look at this, we, we see that Jesus died. He went through all of this. Why did Jesus go through with this? And why was it the will of God? And when he prayed, he said, not, thy, not my will, but thine be done. And so why was it God's will for a man to be treated like this? And, and all of this, a man that was punished uh, in, a, in the most horrible way, way that you can think of and yet here was a man that lived his life without sin never had done anything wrong in his whole life but he was uh, uh, he was punished for sin well if we look in the third in the 53rd chapter of uh, the book of Isaiah the Bible says that he was uh, he was crucified and, and all uh, that he was punished for the sins that you and I do you see, God is a just God, and God hates sin. Why do you think God hates sin? Why, why would God be? And, and I mean, God hates sin in a, in a horrible way. Uh, and the reason God hates sin is because God is a God of love. And sin brings sorrow and, and hurting and horrible things in people's lives. When we sin, or anybody around this sins, it not only hurts the person that's committing the sin, but it hurts people around them. I was thinking about the situation and, that we have in our country and all of our communities across America. I don't believe there's any community that exempt from it, and that's the problem with drugs. And we find that, that uh, every one of us is, is affected by the horrible effects of drugs. People steal out of your garage to sell things to... to to support their habit and and they just do all kinds of things. I was trying to help a fellow out and he ended up stealing from me and uh, and all because he had a drug problem and he needed to support that problem. Uh, and so God hates to see uh, people mistreated and so forth and and, uh, and all of that. He hated sin. Well, he found out or he didn't find out. He already knew that man cannot make an atonement for their own sins. I think about the story of the, the, uh, the, the young lady that uh, was speeding and uh, she was pulled over and she got a traffic ticket uh, for speeding. And so when she came to court to face the, the uh, results of this speeding, uh, guess who the judge was? <clears throat> the judge was her father. And so she came before him and and uh, so he, she pleaded guilty, and and he said, uh, he and and he had to make decisions according to the law. He could not <coughs> circumvent the law. He had to make decisions according to the law. And God has made made a decision, and I can show you in the Old Testament where it says that he that sinneth shall surely die. That's the penalty for sin is death. And so as we look at this, we find that uh, this judge uh, pronounced the, the, the penalty for this speeding ticket that his daughter got, and, and he fined her $100. And then as the story goes, he, he took his royal robe off, and he went down, and he took out his wallet, and he paid, give $100 to the bailiff, to pay the ticket for that his daughter, the fine that his daughter deserved. 
Well, that's what, what happened on the cross, is we deserve to die for the sins that we've committed in our lives. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so we've all been guilty of, of sin and worthy of death. Well, Jesus then, when he died on the cross, he paid the debt that we owed. And we sing a lot of songs about that, don't we? He paid a debt he did not owe. We owed a debt we could not pay. Uh, one of the courses that we sing, and there are several others, and another one we sang, I believe, last week is, I should have been crucified, and, and so forth. And uh, uh, so we owed a debt of, uh, of, for our sins, and that debt to penalty was, was death. But Jesus paid that debt in our place, just like the judge paid the ticket for his daughter. And so we find that he was crucified for that reason. He died on the cross. And then, as we read the story, uh, as it goes, there was a man that was a very rich man that lived in Jerusalem, but he loved Jesus. His name was Joseph, and he was from Arimathea, and he went to Pilate, and he begged for the body of Christ, and he took the body, and he put it in his tomb that he had, had hollowed out in the rock, uh, and he let, put Jesus in there, and Jesus was buried in the tomb of Joseph Ar Arimathea. Now, uh, this is the story, and I've just kind of hit some highlights here this morning. There's many things else that, that uh, took place that, uh, for the sake of time, I don't have time to get in all of those things. But as we look at those things, we find that this is what happened when Jesus died on the cross. And we see a lot of people wearing crosses around their neck and, and uh, have them in their homes. And they have a lot of things uh, that uh, where the cross now is a symbol of Christianity and, and all of this. And so as we look at this story this morning, we find, and I'm going to leave Jesus in the tomb this morning. Uh, and uh, uh, next week. I'm going to tell the rest of the story uh, about uh, the resurrection and so forth. But this morning, uh, I just want to say before I, before I close this morning, I just want to say this, that, that uh, Jesus died on the cross that you and I can be saved. Uh, he paid the, the penalty for our sins, and we can be saved. And all he asks us to do is, is to accept salvation that he paid uh, that he died for and gave up his life for uh, John 3 16 says for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life and the Bible declares to us that salvation is a gift from the Lord it's not a free gift it's all paid for but, it's, but it was paid for on the cross for uh, each and every human being that, uh, that there is on this planet. And so it's open for all. And if you haven't accepted the Lord as your personal Savior this morning, I want to encourage you to open your heart, invite Him into your life, commit your life to Him, and just simply ask Him to forgive you of your sins and accept Him in your life as your personal Savior. And so with that this morning, I'd like to ask for all of us to stand. And as we dismiss, I want to just ask everybody, do you, uh, is there anybody that has a need this morning? Is there anybody here that would like to accept Jesus?